A very warm welcome to all of you on behalf of Azim Premji University. We are delighted to be presenting today's program in our series of public lectures here in Bangalore. Public lectures are one of the ways by which the Azim Premji Foundation promotes its vision of a just, equitable, humane, and sustainable society. I know many of you regularly attend our public lectures and you come here because you are invested in education and development of the country and because you are well-wishers of Azim Premji University. There are several of our students who have done a two-hour commute to be here. Uh, thank you very much. A bit about the program for this evening. Uh, soon after this introduction, Professor Michael Roth will deliver his talk for about 45 minutes or so. He will then be in conversation with my colleague, Professor Sita Ramam, Ram for short, uh, for about 20 minutes. Ram is the director of the School of Policy and Governance at our university. A brief introduction to the speaker. Uh, Professor Michael Roth's CV was part of the invitation, so I'll just pick up a couple of highlights. Professor Roth is an American academic and university administrator, Wesleyan University's 16th president and has been in that role since 2007. He earned his PhD in history from Princeton. Uh, so since Oppenheimer is the toast of the day, if you have any questions on the Princeton campus, then <laughs> here is the man. And has held notable positions, including founding director of the Scripps College Humanities Research Institute and president of the California College of Arts. An acclaimed author, his book, Beyond the University, Why Liberal Education Matters, won the Association of American Colleges and Universities Frederick Ness Award. His recent book, Safe Enough Spaces, uh, a pragmatist approach to inclusion, free speech, and political correctness, addresses contentious issues in higher education. His scholarly interests are centered around how people make sense of the past. He will now deliver his talk on the student, the history of an idea. Please join me in welcoming Professor Michael Roth. Thank you for coming out this, this evening, and I will do my best to not wander about because uh, there, we, um, we're, we're taping this and um, I'm told that it would be unfair to those who would watch it on video if I roamed about. Typically I would go and bother you in the audience and make sure you were staying awake, um, but I have to stay here on my perch, which I will do. I'm going to talk to you about uh, the history of the idea of the student which is uh, what I've, uh, my most recent book is about. It's called The Student, A Short History, and it examines the trajectory of the idea of us being a student from the Confucius to the present with a very, very heavy emphasis on, the, on uh, Western culture, on uh, Europe and the United States. And so maybe in our conversation afterwards, uh, people will have some suggestions about how I might broaden uh, my, my lens to in, in incorporate uh, other ideas of being a student um, out, outside of the West. I, in the book, I, I do uh, uh, have an apology in the beginning of the book that, that it, it leaves out many traditions uh, of learning that uh, have been so vital. But um, uh, I, I, I'm a, as a university president, I have only a couple of months a year to write. And so um, I decided to, uh, to focus my attention on the emergence of an idea of the student, which is still, I think, very powerful um, uh, uh, around the world and, and especially uh, in the West. Let me see if I do this correctly. There I am. So I begin with uh, three iconic teachers. And uh, I did that because one of the things that defines what it means to be a student is to have a teacher. And again, we could talk about this in, in, the, in the conversational part of the evening, but um, it, it's, it's certainly a lot harder, I don't know if it's impossible, but it's a lot harder to be a student if you don't have a teacher. And I chose three iconic teachers to write about at the beginning of, of my book. As you see here, Confucius, Socrates, and Jesus. So uh, uh, this, this could fit three volumes of many hundred pages each. I give it a chapter in the beginning of uh, The Student, A Short History. 
And I, because I want to set these as ideal types of instruction, of being a teacher, uh, Confucius, the, the notion is that you, you, as a student, you follow a path. If you're a, a student of Confucius, and I look at three, the names are here, uh, the, you, you, what you're learning is to follow the path of the master. Uh, it, in the case of Socrates, I also look at, at, at three students, although the city of Athens uh, it stretches that notion a little bit. For Socrates, uh, being a, a student is being a um, critical interlocutor, a critical conversation partner. And for, in the case of Jesus as teacher, being a student of Jesus, being an apostle, these are all, of course, apostles, uh, and the last one spectacularly failed, of uh, Oswald, uh, 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 it means imitating, uh, G imitating your teacher, imitating Jesus. So with Confucius, it, it's, it's very important, as my Neo-Confucian friends tell me, that following a path uh, doesn't just mean a narrowness, necessarily, doesn't just mean that you are only walking in the, the, the steps of your teacher uh, narrowly conceived, because these three uh, uh, followers of Confucius, they did that very differently. Uh, one with, with kind of uh, martial uh, enthusiasm, uh, another with, uh, uh, with great piety, um, and, and so there are different ways of following the path of Confucius. And part of being a good student of Confucius meant to find your own way of following a path. Finding your own way, but still following the path of the master, as, as, as Confucius is often called in the texts that have come down to us. Socrates, for Americans, and, and I think it's still true in Europe, Socrates is the Uber teacher. <laughs> he is the, of, of these iconic teachers, he's the most familiar to um, American students today. And, and, and Socrates' uh, uh, teaching, his, 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 uh, his core theme uh, comes down to us as what we call today critical thinking, especially in the United States. It, it, uh, it seems like everybody's in favor of very little these days. You can, you can pick a fight with people about almost anything, right? Because there's so much d division uh, in the world. But one thing almost all academics agree on in the United States is that we need more critical thinking. And so, of course, being a contrary in myself, I, I wrote a piece some years ago, it's in Beyond the University, that, cri that, that critical thinking is overrated. That we, 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 and, and, and because what Socrates did, whereas Confucius had followed this path, Socrates, his method with his students was to say, see that guy over there? He has people following him, but let's go talk to him and I'll show you he doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> I'll show you that his so-called knowledge is built on sand. Um, and so what his young uh, interlocutors learn is what we, we positively call critical thinking. But what they also learn is that the highest virtue is to be suspicious of everyone. And so my criticism of this tradition uh, is that when, when one pushes on this a little bit, it's very clear that although suspicion is a good thing sometimes, to think of it as the highest virtue, as the only thing you can agree with people about, shows a kind of sickness in the culture. We can come back and, and, and talk about that. But nonetheless, despite the fact that I'm critical of it, it still <laughs> remains extremely powerful as a vehicle for, for understanding what it means to learn things, to be in the situation of a learner um, uh, uh, and, and, and a critical interlocutor. And then in the case of Jesus, this idea of imitating a life. In Christianity, there's for, for centuries and centuries, it's the, the, it's so important that we, we learn not just to analyze what Jesus said, not just to read the texts, but to imitate a way of being. And so these three paths, following the, the, your teacher's path, uh, learning to be suspicious, and imitating a virtuous life, these come down to us as iconic modes uh, of, of teaching and hence of learning.
So in the in the after this introduction in in beyond uh, the, this in the the student a short history, uh, I I spend a, a, a couple of chapters on what it meant to be a student before there was very there were very many schools, because the easy way to say oh I know what a student is a student is somebody who's in a school. But before there were schools, before most people went to schools, there was a state akin to studenthood, if I can use that word. Um, and what young people were supposed to learn before they were viewed as mature adults, uh, I think one can say, we can offer generalizations about. And here are the three things um, uh, that I took away from this being a student before schooling is institutionalized. What young people are supposed to achieve in their student years is independence. What does independence mean in, the, in this context? Very narrowly, it means that you don't need money from your parents. So I have three children. One of them has yet to learn this. That's a joke. You can laugh whenever you feel like it. Thank you very much. Um, no, you know, I, you, I, I don't know. Maybe this is different in... in, in uh, in Bangalore than it is in, in New York, but there's a, a great moaning of, of, uh, of parents whose, whose children go to university, graduate, and then come home and live in, the, you know, in their old room. You know, if the first week it seems very nice but, uh, for the parents, but it gets old quickly because what you want from being a student is that you are not going to be dependent on the people who sent you to school. So economic autonomy, independence as economic autonomy was absolutely crucial for the notion of being a, for graduating from being a student um, in the pre-modern period in the West. But there's a second factor that of, it often is overlooked. I mean, the, we all know that the, the point of learning skills, whether it's farming or a trade, is that you can become economically independent. But the other aspect of moving through your student years is to learn how to be integrated into a community. Your parents have a household in a village, let's say, or, or they're, they're, they're working on someone's farm, or they, uh, or they have a trade in a town. Um, they, are, they are not just individuals in that uh, uh, picture. They are members of communities. And the, what you're supposed to learn while you're a student in this pre-modern period is how to be economically independent and to become a member of the community on your own terms or in your own right. So integration and autonomy. And that often means in some that you, you set up, the, you have the capacity to set up your own household. That often means, it usually means marriage. Uh, it, but, and most especially it means that you are seen by your community as an autonomous yet integrated member of, of that community. And so that period of, of studenthood is the period be, from between infancy or total dependence and autonomy and integration. This period of, of learning to uh, stand on your own feet, but in the context of community. The way many people learned about uh, that process or how to fully engage that process was by being apprentices. And, and um, in the United States these days, there's, there's talk of re-energizing re, uh, an apprenticeship program. Um, and I look at, at uh, broadly at apprenticeship across Western Europe um, and, and I, um, decided to tell the story of, of the, the basic contractual arrangements that apprenticeships entail, that entailed by apprenticeships. Uh, things like, uh, you agreed to be respectful to your master. You agreed not to have romantic relationships with the, the, the daughters and sons of your master. You agreed not to get drunk too often. These are all in the contracts we have. Um, and. Um, and so I, I talk about that. These are basic things that historians of the period uh, uh, know well. But, I, but then I decided to, um, to write about failed apprenticeships 
and, and here I could just, as an aside, I, I, I was a student of Michel Foucault's many years ago, and I was working on French intellectual history, and, and I, I was very much influenced by Foucault's um, approach to the past, which is really to say, uh, don't look at achievements, look at failures. If you want to know uh, uh, about X, look, what ha look at what happens when X doesn't work. Look at the underside of whatever you think you want to study. For a long time, I worked on the history of memory. And uh, I, I decided in this Foucauldian approach that instead of looking at memory straight, I would say, how do people understand disorders of memory? Because if you understand the disorder, then you can understand the normative values that go into creating the order. In this case, in order to understand apprenticeships, I looked at some um, odd apprenticeships, women apprenticeships in London, um, like Eleanor Mosley, um, who uh, starts off as a, as a, uh, a milliner and winds up uh, employing many, many young girls as milliners. And by virtue of their apprenticeship with her, they go off to set up their own shops, independent economic agents that are part of a community, in this case, the city of London. But then my failed apprenticeships, I, f I, I focused on two because they're such wonderful uh, figures and such in interesting stories, I think. Um, the, the first is Ben Franklin, I don't know how well known Ben Franklin is in, in uh, India, but in America, Ben Franklin is like, uh, uh, I don't know, he's, he's as familiar um, as, as uh, 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 you know, a coffee with milk in it or something like that. I mean, he's, he's just, a, he's, on a, he's on the currency. He's, when you're a child, you learn about Ben Franklin's uh, exploits as a scientist and as a uh, member of the, the founding generation of the United States. So I look at Franklin and then Jean-Jacques Rousseau, um, uh, who, the political philosopher. I, I'll just give you a taste of why they, their apprenticeships failed. I do think it's interesting in light of what is to come in, in, in the argument about being a student in the modern period. Franklin wants to be a sailor. He's growing up in colonial uh, uh, America uh, and he wants to go off to sea as an as a, as a, uh, adventurous young man might. But one of his siblings died in a, a, a shipwreck, and so his parents are not sending him on a boat. That's off the limits. And so um, they don't have enough money for him to become uh, uh, an intellectual or a clergyman. And so they, they uh, send him to work with his brother, who prints a newspaper in Boston. Um, and, and when they mean send him to work, that means that he has a contract with his brother that says that his brother will feed him and employ him all day and give him a place to live for a certain number of years. And, 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 and basically Ben has to do whatever his older brother says um, for that period until he takes the freedom, is what the expression is, for no longer being an apprentice. The thing with Franklin, though, is he's just too good at everything. So while he's working for his brother, he's learning how to set type, he's learning how to edit things, he's learning how to distribute newspapers, he starts writing columns, uh, but under pseudonyms, like under a woman's name. And his great misfortune is he's an extremely talented writer, and so the columns become very famous. And his brother is quite annoyed because the, the regular columns in the paper don't do that well. Then everybody's reading Ms. Good, do Good, I think is the, one of the pseudonyms. Um, uh, and, and finally, they, it's, uh, he's, Ben Franklin's unmasked. And his brother is furious at his little, the older brother is furious at the younger brother, the apprentice's success. Um, and they come to blows and it's a, it's a t difficult situation. Um, and uh, eventually, Ben Franklin's older brother is uh, arrested because he's writing too, um, uh, uh, too much protest material against the British. And the family arranged for the younger brother to have a secret contract where he would make believe he's running the paper but actually still be uh, indentured to his older brother. And Ben Franklin said, I could have done this, I could have done this. But my older brother, and it's a beautiful phrase, I think, he beat me more than was necessary. Beat me more than was necessary. And because and, and, Franklin says, you know, I deserve to be beaten a few times. I was, you know, bad, I was a very obnoxious young person and did a lot of bad things. Um, but at some point, it, it just got too brutal. And Franklin realizes that although he has a contract, since the contract is secret, 
you can't enforce it, right? You can't take, he can't go take him to court because the, it's a secret contract and the older brother is, is uh, 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 on the outs with the British authorities. So Ben Franklin escapes to Philadelphia and sets up his own newspaper, sets up his own university, sets up his own science experiments and becomes the kind of toast of the colonies and eventually one of the founders of the United States of America. Around the same time, Jean-Jacques Rousseau's uh, uh, father, uh, his mother died very, uh, right after uh, uh, Jean-Jacques was born, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau's father sends him to work uh, at an, for an engraver. Um, and, uh, and Rousseau also says, the, the, as an apprentice, he was subject to so much physical violence. And Rousseau says, what did I learn from working for a tyrant? I learned not so much to be a better engraver, which is what the master wanted. He said, I learned to do everything I could to annoy the master. So he said things like, um, um, I didn't really like the, uh, um, let's pretend this is a cup of coffee. I, I, I didn't really like coffee, but I knew this was my master's coffee, so I would steal it and drink it. Yeah. I, I, I had no taste for fruit. I had no taste for fruit, Rousseau says. But because the master hid all the fruit in a certain part of the apartment, I stole it. Which is actually the, becomes the core of Rousseau's political philosophy, which is that modernity corrupts us because we desire only the things that other people teach us to desire. Rousseau said, what did my master teach me? He taught me to be perverse. That is, I wanted the only things I wanted were the things that, not that I really wanted, but that would annoy him. And so Rousseau is out one day on his day off, walking around Geneva, which is where he was apprenticed, and uh, he came back too late. And in those days, they locked the gates of the city. And he realized if he went back, he was going to be beaten ever more severely. And so he fled into the arms of an older woman named Madame de Verhain and becomes, uh, over time, a great composer of opera, a great political philosopher, and a failed apprentice. Why did these two guys fail in their, as being students, as apprentices? They failed because they wanted something that the old system couldn't give them, which was freedom. And so the argument of the second half of the, uh, the student of short history is that in the modern and contemporary periods, the idea of being a student, a good student, is linked to the idea of freedom. And so the, the figure I, I focus on here uh, uh, is Immanuel Kant, the great German philosopher, who says in the essay, What is Enlightenment? Enlightenment is man's emergence from his self-incurred immaturity. Enlightenment is freedom from self-imposed immaturity. You, you, you still act like a child, not because you have to. I have a grandson, he acts like a child because he can't do a lot of stuff. I have a, 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 another a child who is you know, quite capable of doing lots of things, but he acts like a child because he pushes himself to the point of dependence. He has self-incurred immaturity. And what happens in the modern world is that being a student gets linked to liberating yourself from your own immaturity, which means Kant says, and I go on to, to emphasize, um, it means liberating yourself so that you can think for yourself. That you have ideas that can withstand free and public examination. That being a student in the modern and contemporary world means practicing freedom. Now, Tagore said much the same thing as, you know, a century later, a century and a half later, uh, but many people in education uh, uh, in the modern period push back against that because they think of education more as training or uh, as imitation. But this notion of being a student as, as the time in which you learn to think for yourself in the company of others, standing on your own feet intellectually, this becomes the core modern idea, idea of being a student. Uh, another figure that I thought of as really vital for this process was the American philosopher and, and uh, writer Ralph Waldo Emerson, 
He took this idea of standing on your own feet intellectually, thinking for yourself in the company of others, and he radicalized it. He saw it as a, as a romantic notion. Here's Emerson. Higher education should ignite students' spirit and intelligence with the materials from nature and the past, not merely show them how to digest the materials. Colleges can only serve us, he wrote, when they aim not to drill, but to create. When they gather from every ray of various genius to their hospitable halls, and by their concentrated fires, set the hearts of the youth aflame. So Emerson is different from Kant in, the, in certainly in tone, in emotional, uh, the emotional register he uses. For Kant, it's thinking for yourself in the company of others in a very abstract way. For Emerson, it's learning to find your passions and actualize them uh, with concentrated fire with concentrated fire. So throughout the 1800s, in, especially in Germany and eventually in the United States, um, the notion of practicing freedom as the core of, a, uh, of studenthood becomes more and more popular. It gets linked to the ideal of liberal education. In, in German, uh, we use the phrase Bildung right, for that. The, the, the notion that being a student is the time when you acquire the traits of character, the skills, and the spirit of living on your own terms within a community. Um, and that ideal of liberal education uh, includes uh, uh, developing your capacity economically, but it's not at all limited to that. Um, and I spent some time in, in that um, uh, part of the book writing about uh, being a student in Germany in the 1800s, and the freedoms that German students and universities were given. They were extensive. I don't know how it is uh, here at, uh, at uh, Azim University or other universities uh, in, in India. I mean, in Germany in the, in, the, in the late 1800s, nobody told you to go to class. Nobody told you uh, what classes to take. You were free to choose. And so the Americans who went to Germany on the kind of study abroad uh, 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 semester or, or year, they were quite shocked because what they saw with German students, they basically hung out in bars and they got into fights and there was a lot of dueling, there was a lot of dueling with swords. And the Americans were appalled because we Americans are very moral people, you may have heard. You know, we're, we're, all, we're easily appalled anyway. I don't know how moral we are. They're easily appalled. And, but, when they, but then they said, listen, what German universities are giving their students, which we Americans were not giving, is the freedom to choose their subjects, freedom to chart their own intellectual paths, the freedom to say, I'm not going to do that today, and then fail. The professors did what they do. And what they, the Americans noticed is, in that first year or two, the students waste a fair amount of time growing up. But then they, they go to the lecture, as you have today, not because you're going to get a, a check mark or a, a, you know, a, a, a credit. You go because you, you, you want to be there. You want to learn. And, and that ethos is that of, of learning freedom by practicing it, not by being forced to take a math course or being forced to take a history course, being forced to take uh, something else, but learning because you are moved to so learn. That becomes vital in uh, mo the modern university as Germany builds it and then America, as we often do, appropriates it um, in the late 1800s and early 1900s. I, I talk about two uh, uh, spectacular American uh, intellectuals, uh, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois and Jane Addams. Uh, du Bois uh, was this extraordinary uh, uh, student, one of the, the great students in American history. Uh, he grew up in a, not, not far from where I live in, in Massachusetts, uh, Great Barrington, tiny little town in Massachusetts, one of the few black people in the town when he grew up. Um, and so the town, he was a genius kid. They didn't really know what to do with him. Um, and so they took up a collection to send him to a university in the south of the United States where he would see other black kids because uh, he, in, in western Massachusetts there were very few and far between. And, and W.B. Du Bois, he, was, he, 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 didn't, he, he didn't seem to care because it was, racism was not yet 
a big part of his life. He learned about racism when he went to school in the southern part of the United States and realized he couldn't go off campus because if he went off campus as a black person, white people might beat him up or worse. He learned about black culture in America uh, for the first time when he went to a college in the south of the United States, and, and he excelled in everything he did in, in Hampton. And then, he, and then he went up to Harvard, uh, again, one of the few black students at Harvard at the time, and he won every prize and, and smashed every record, and you know, he studied with William James and Santa Ana and you know, the, the great lights of the day, and eventually got a scholarship to go to Germany. And Du Bois is one of these intellectuals that just, just love being a student. You may know people like this. You may be a person like this yourself. He just couldn't get enough of learning. It wasn't so much about finishing a paper <laughs> or, or doing a project. It was just that experience of learning new things. And so when Du Bois goes to Germany, he feels so free, he says. I mean, because he wasn't looked at as a black person. He was just looked at as a student. He is shocked, he says, when he gets off, a, he goes on a boat ride, uh, a tour with a German family, and, um, and one of the, the young women proposes marriage to him. And he was shocked. He thought he was going to get killed by these white people. And, and they didn't think of him as a black person. They just thought of him as this incredibly interesting, smart, kind, handsome man. And Du Bois spends a couple of years in Germany on a scholarship. And you know you can't. I, for me, it's like a, it's like a hungry person at a buffet. He just could keep going and going and going, and and uh, but until the scholarship ran out. And it's very sad. At the end of this, he writes in his autobiography. He's on the boat and he sees himself coming back into New York Harbor, and he says, "This is I'm, I'm coming." And he uses more offensive language. I won't use it here, but he, I'm coming back where I, where people will hate me because I'm black. Welcome home. And so for him, being a student was practicing freedom. I mean, it just was that feeling you sometimes get when you're learning and you don't see the time go by, you don't see who, you don't care about a grade, you just feel like you're, you're getting new things that make you feel more human, more alive. The other person who did that so spectacularly was Jane Addams, but she had a different experience. Jane Addams uh, grew up in the late 1800s uh, um, in Illinois, and there a girl going to college was very unusual. And Jane Addams is, uh, 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 was an unusual girl. She, she, she was so smart, everyone knew how smart she was. She was clearly a superior intelligence. But her father said, listen, but Jane, you're a girl. You, you know, you're kind of fragile. And so he said, why don't you go to this convent school, a religious school, just for girls. And while you're there, you, you see how you do, you can get, and, you, and he was hoping she'd get over the desire to be a student, really, I think. And she goes to the school, she's the editor of the paper, and she gets all the prizes, and she's knocking the ball out of the park. And, and, um, and, then, and then she says, okay, Daddy, I, I can, now I can go to Smith College, where she really wanted to go and become a doctor. And he says, well, you're still a girl. <laughs> you know, you're still fragile. Um, and so she's very frustrated by this. And then her father passes away. Um, and uh, I'm not supposed to say pass away, apparently. No. <laughs> no. So her father passes away. And, and, um, and, uh, uh, but Jane Addams, does not, she gets the money. But she, she does not actually um, go off to the college um, as a... Um, as a, uh, I, I did a lot of work on Freud, and we Freudians know that the most powerful father is a dead father. Um, and, and, um, and so Jane Addams actually decides, I'm not going to go to college, even though her father's not there to stop her. She goes to Europe on a tour with some of her, her friends, and here's the point, I, uh, finally, <laughs> uh, here's the point. She, she's walking across the street in London, and she sees a, somebody crossing the street down the road from her, and this fellow is run over by a uh, horse-drawn cab. Just not, you know, terrible accident. And what does Jane Addams do in this moment of crisis? She thinks of de Musset, who has a poem in which he quotes Homer, uh, who has a poem in which he talks about a man being run over by a horse. And she feels herself doing this. In the face of human tragedy, what does she do? She thinks about a book about a book about a, a, an event. And she stops herself and says, this is what being a student means? This is what learning means? No, she says. I should learn to practice freedom 
And for Jane Adams, practicing freedom meant um, serving others. So she goes back to Chicago. She, she establishes an uh, institution called Hull House, the, the greatest uh, uh, aid society for immigrants in the United States. She becomes a, a radical pacifist uh, in the United States, very, becomes very popular until World War I. When then the Americans want to go to war, then they, they hate her. But she sticks to her, not guns, she sticks to her vocation. She sticks to her, her ideals, um, which is being a student by practicing freedom and developing a sensibility of sympathy. Because sometimes people think being a student means learning for yourself. Du Bois and Adams, especially Jane Adams, shows that being a student can be learning so that you can react more pragmatically, more powerfully, more compassionately to people who need you, who are right around you. Finally, I spend some time in the book talking about the different kinds of students that America has in colleges in the 20th uh, century. And, and, and uh, we could talk more about this in the, uh, in the conversational part of the evening, if you would like. Um, and, and they range from, uh, from uh, I'll go in reverse order, from the, the nerds. I don't know if this is a word that has resonance here. And it, yes, it does. Uh, so, you know, a nerd, I, was, I always said I was a nerd at Wesleyan, you know, I, I, when I was an undergraduate. I was so afraid that I didn't, know, and I, I didn't know anything that I studied, 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 studied all the time. I actually learned to do transcendental meditation when I was a, a, a student in the 70s, it was a thing in America. I, but I learned to do meditation so that I wouldn't have to sleep, so I could study more, which was not what my meditation teacher thought was a good idea. <laughs> you know, that's what a nerd does, right? A, a grind, uh, somebody who just tries to work for the, for, for the institution. Uh, but American colleges have often produced radicals and free spirits. And so you see in American politics, I'm not sure this happens in India to the same extent, you can tell me, um, in American politics, studenthood is a flashpoint for politicians. Uh, especially from the conservatives these days, or I would call it right-wing authoritarians in the United States, they love attacking college students. Why? Because college students tend to be more radical. They tend to be free spirits. They tend um, not to fit in. In the 1960s, we had the generation gap, uh, lots of complaints from older people about uh, the young people not understanding anything. In the 1990s in the United States, we had the, lots of complaints about political correctness. If you, want, if you were an academic and you wanted to make money writing a book, um, those are hard things to do together, being an academic and making money writing a book, um, you, you complained about political correctness, that college students today don't uh, uh, fr think freely because they're all trying to be more politically correct than the next person. That was in the 1990s, but it's very similar to what we see today in the United States, and probably you have conversations about this here in India, about woke culture. Is this a term you see here? And woke, woke, coach, woke culture, which is just racialized notion of political correct, correctness. But the complaint is that students today on college campuses uh, are unlike when I was a young person. They don't think for themselves. And, and um, I, I, I take these complaints very skeptically. I think this is what happens when you get to be, I'm, I'm 66, when you get to be my age, you start complaining about young people. Why? And some people start quite early, actually. So why? Because you're not young anymore, and, it's, and, you, and, you, and it hurts. Right? And so you find ways to complain about young people. And, and, and in the United States, this it's is a real industry in, acad in academia. Uh, and I, I, I think it's a, it's a terrible thing because if you're a teacher, you should not complain about students. You should teach them. And if you can't teach them, it's not their fault. And I, I, I think that this is a, 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 but it's easier to say it's their fault than to actually say, I, I can't connect to these students today. Which is hard as you get older. My students today disagree with me about many things and they tell me all the time. But my job as a teacher is to find a way to connect to them so that they can have the experience that I so valued, which was um, practicing freedom in a way that allowed me to stand on my own feet in the company of others.
So finally, and I think, I think this is getting towards the, maybe the last slide, um, I, I conclude by calling for um, an understanding about the links between being a college student and practicing freedom, an ethos of experimentation and openness. In the US, and I suspect in some places here in India, there's a great push to have university students become more capable of contributing to the economy, to have university students really focus on those skills that will, on day one, give them uh, a job that pays their bills and contributes to the, uh, 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 to the economy. Uh, what I argue in the student is that although it is so important to be economically independent, it was in the early, in the pre-modern period, it is not enough. That being a student today should be a combination of the three iconic teachers methodologies, following a, a path which includes learning skills, developing crafts. It has to include critical questioning because Lord knows there's so much unreliable information out there that you need the skills of critical thinking to, um, to sort through that information, to know when you're being lied to, especially by people with power. And Emulation or imitation also uh, is a, a core idea of learning that comes through an examination of the history of being a student because what is empathy if it's not being able to see yourself in the shoes of another? Emulation is a technique of not just standing in your own place but trying to stand in the shoes of another. So I, I do believe that, um, that being a student is uh, this ethos of practicing freedom so that you can think for yourself in the company of others. Okay, uh, to think for yourself in the company of others. Uh, and, and I try, as you can hear, I hope you can hear, I'm trying to have my cake and eat it too, right? In other words, think for yourself may seem quite isolating if you're in the crowd and you're thinking for yourself. But what I'm arguing for is a kind of uh, a, a student life that would take very seriously that you're always entangled with others. You're never just on your own. But at the same time, to aspire to not think someone else's thoughts, to not adopt someone else's attitudes, to not just imitate someone else's uh, way of life, but to find through the combination of those techniques, those practices, find a freedom that serves you and the people around you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Roth. Very insightful, scintillating, and an extraordinarily complex topic called the student, but you helped us understand uh, quite a few things, the entire book that you have written. So I don't think I have the wherewithal to emulate you on the simulating <laughs> levels, uh, nor am I going to ask such questions which might generate the level of uh, curiosity that many audience may have. So I would keep myself to few uh, sort of Overture of sorts. Okay. And then let's open it to the uh, wider audience and see what they would have. It's an extraordinarily interesting way that you have presented the student sort of Thank you. idea. Um, I'm going to begin with the hard one, which is your take on Socrates. Ah, yes. <laughs> uh, I'm actually wondering whether uh, you tried very deliberately somewhat being provocative, uh, that the critical uh, thinking is some kind of a problematic, uh, and I suppose the way you presented Socrates. I was remembering actually in part, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, the economic philosopher Amartya Sen yes. and his uh, idea of uh, argumentative Indian, right? So in other words, uh, the imagination of uh, Indian as somebody who thrives and revels in argumentation, yeah. which I'm uh, equating with, for instance, in much of the Greek philosophy, this agonism yeah. and this idea of engagement with each other. I'm sure Sain did not visualize the today's TV debates as argumentative Indian, obviously. The today's TV debates obviously are cross-purpose conversations, proxy conversation mm -hmm. to your audience. Quite like you said, American TV obviously, uh, I mean I suppose the politicians today are not talking to one another, but they're talking to their, uh, you know, kind yeah. of echo chambers yes. of sorts, right? So when that kind of transformation happened, I understand. That I won't consider as critical thinking, but critical thinking for me is an argumentative person in an agonistic way engaging with each other. So would you consider a somewhat more charitable sort of yes. view on Socrates? So I, for sure, and, and I mean, it, 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 the first, first thing is that the only way to really pay homage to Socrates would be by being critical of Socrates, right? So, right. Right. <laughs> so, uh, so, th so there, there's, there's that for starters. Uh, and uh, when I, uh, when I wrote a piece called Beyond Critical Thinking some years ago, because I felt that um, that Socratic skepticism um, was so important for. Um, uh, uh, discerning uh, f true information or reliable information and unreliable information for taking people down a peg who have power and confidence but don't really know what they're talking about. Although absolutely crucial. What I found was uh, that among my students and some of my colleagues, this became a posture that allowed them to not open themselves up to, the, to anything. So that in this argumentative mode, they were very unlikely to appreciate something that was beautiful, to be moved by something that was glorious. Um, they would be much more capable of saying, oh, you all found that glorious? Ha <laughs> ha That's because you're not very bright. Because if you look at the behind the curtain, it's not so glorious. Right. And so what I found, and I see this with my students all the time, especially the very smart ones, <laughs> that they'll say, um, this book we're reading, uh, they'll always say to me something like this, Kant says, uh, enlightenment is freedom from self-imposed immaturity. I think Kant is wrong because Kant was, and I stop them and I say, no one cares what you think about Kant. I don't care what you think about Kant. I want you to tell me what Kant said and why Kant said it. Right. But they're so used to it being given uh, uh, flowers or, or good grades for, show, for taking things down a peg that they sometimes don't s try to understand why the text is as has seemed to others as powerful as it seemed. And to, on, in the realm of aesthetics, I think it's even more pronounced that uh, when I, so I teach a course on philosophy in the movies, and we watch mostly old films, old Hollywood films, right. and I, I, I try to, t I tell the students that, that they should try to put themselves in a position where they are seduced by the film. Because they're really good at preventing themselves from being seduced by anything, a work of art. Right. They're very good at, at being skeptical. But I say, okay, for purposes of this class, or at least this week, try to put yourself, put yourself, move your chair, whatever you have to do, so that you can think this is the greatest thing you've ever seen. That means you're opening your heart. That means um, not being prematurely critical. Because yeah. I think criticism can come later, but it's really hard to love something when you start off being critical of it. Right. Um, but you know, what you are imagining as a very rational sequential process obviously is not the way learning happens, you know better than all others here. Uh, so is it not therefore uh, a kind of uh, pushback on somebody's enthusiasm of raising questions? Right? So I'll yeah. just say something, right? So I remember C.B. McPherson's work, the Canadian political philosopher, who actually said, you know, liberalism is not so democratic in its origins. 
It's only through consistent and persistent kind of questioning from various quarters that actually it transformed into liberal yeah. democracy, right? So if that is so essential for being a transformative in democratic process, uh, and I suppose any kind of question, is it not that we should welcome rather than giving a pushback? I, I, I think um, it's, it's, it's uh, necessary, but not sufficient. Yeah. And so I, I do think we, th th there, is a, there are times to be welcoming of that, but so if I, if I had a class where everybody was eagerly trying to you know, like everything that I liked and try to anticipate, then, then I would do something quite different. But I find that American college students, um, they are trained to take things down. Okay. And um, a, a friend of mine, a person I admire quite a lot, is named Ibu Patel. He he's, works in the United States on, on issues of pluralism. And he puts it this way, that there's a season for this criticism. Right. And there's another season when you also want people to, to say, um, I really love something. So if, if, if you know, if you, if you, you I don't know what, uh, I'll, I'll try the cricket analogy. Right. So <laughs> if you're going to a cricket match uh, with, um, I don't know, someone like a Socratic um, um, uh, uh, post-Marxist uh, anti-sports uh, person, and you're watching the cricket match with this person, and every time something really exciting happens, this person turns to you and says, do you know those people are exploited, and, uh, <laughs> and it's all bad for the environment, and it's encouraging male violence. I don't know, all these things we right. could say. Right. And, and you're like, I want to watch that. That was a beautiful right. moment in the game just now. And so I, I think that there's a season for putting yourself in a position where you can see how beautiful that game is or the art is. And you know, you can always, you can ask also those critical questions. Right. My last question on the students. So therefore, I'm very curious as to what has been the response of young students to your The Student book. Ah. So, uh, it's hard. It's hard for me to, to say. The response has been the response has been good so far in the sense that there are I've gotten messages from students in Egypt and in Turkey and in China and uh, asking to translate the book mm -hmm. and um, and and I have and and I I think the. Um, I've given a bunch of talks in the United States. It's been positive. It's funny at Wesleyan, you know, because I'm the boss. It was on the president. Um, the people there are more inclined to the Socratic approach, <laughs> where they'll say, "Oh, you say this about practicing freedom, Roth, but you limit our ability to protest you, or you're you're still not supporting this cause that we support." And I take that as a backhanded compliment. You know, in other words, that, that they're act, they're acting like good students by being questioning, uh, 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 and and in some ways, um, uh, some ways, and. Uh, the, the work uh, of their teacher. My, my, um, my efforts at, in the United States have been around trying to create a, a broader platform for intellectual diversity in American colleges and universities. Th there is a kind of groupthink among American college students, I fear, that we as teachers should try to disrupt. We were talking before we started about right. my teacher, Victor Gravich, with whom I did a, a book of letters between the, the Marxist philosopher Alexander Kozhev and the sometimes called conservative philosopher Leo Strauss. And, and I realized when I did this work with, with Victor Gravich, who was my teacher, um, and I knew for many years, I never knew what he thought about politics. Right. I mean, all I knew is that he would tell me, think more about that, or have you thought about the other side of this? Mm. And, and so as a teacher, if, if, if my students were praising something I, I wrote, which is unlikely, <laughs> I, I would ask them, well, what about, and I would try to point to another side, right. because I do think it's very important for this notion of practicing freedom that students develop the agility to see things from someone else's point of view. And, and as a teacher, one of the things I love about working with students over, over all these years is they surprise me. Their points of view are quite different than I expect. And that's how I can learn and I encourage them to learn. You are an uncommon historian in my understanding, whatever I try to look at your writings. And your methods seem to be uh, neither 
completely history of ideas kind, nor is it conventional archival history kind. Right? You seem to have worked out something, maybe what you said, influence of Foucault, but not in genealogy in the dot sense, but through the vantage point of biographies or individual figures, etc. It looks very interesting. Could you just throw some light on how you evolved your method, uh, what kind of uh, things influenced you to think about history that way? Sure, thank you for the question. So I, I, my first book was about psychoanalysis and politics and um, called uh, 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 Psychoanalysis as History. And I was very influenced by this f basic Freudian notion that, oh, it looks like this, so it's probably not that. It'll probably be something else, you know? And although Foucault was in many ways an anti-Freudian, um, uh, when I when I met him in I guess it was the very early 80s late 70s um, uh, I was very taken with his ability to 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 show the underside of it looks like freedom but it's really control or it looks like liberation but it's really another form of of incarceration etc and but at the same time I thought and talked with him about this that he 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 lacked any mechanism for legitimating action. It was always deconstruction. And so I became very concerned with the tendency among my peers and my students uh, to actually get so much satisfaction out of taking things apart that the only people who were constructing things, <laughs> building things, were people who weren't thinking about ideas very much at all. So, as a, I, I, so I do think uh, chronologically, I think historically, it's very important for me to look at things over time, but um, uh, I, um, I have gotten great pleasure, <laughs> that's the best I can do, I've gotten great pleasure for trying to write things for larger groups of people. I did a book on French Hegelianism. Yeah, four people read it. My mother kind of read it, but 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 it was you know it's it's the book on French Hegelianism. <laughs> Judith Butler and I wrote books around the same time about this subject, and 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 uh, it's the night late seventies, um, and that but then I did an exhibition um, for the Getty Center when the Getty Museum opened. And I did an exhibition for the Library of Congress on Sigmund Freud and psychoanalysis. A million, millions of people saw those exhibitions. Right. And so I became very interested in trying to talk about ideas historically to a bigger audience. Yeah. Um, as a teacher, as a curator, and uh, when I can, as a writer. I, I think of myself as a historian, but many historians are suspicious because because I don't spend as much time in archives as as they do. But because they do, I can borrow their work and. <laughs> <laughs>